Well, welcome everyone. I'm Dan Reed. I'm chair of the National Science Board. Uh, we're delighted to be briefing you today on Science and Engineering Indicators 2024. This is the congressionally mandated report on the state of U.S. Science and Engineering, or SE. Uh, and we're thrilled to have you joining us from across the country uh, who are tuning in today. This report uh, is nearly two years uh, in the making, uh, and it is in large part thanks to the hard work of the staff within the National Science Foundation's uh, National Center for Science and Engineering Statistics, otherwise known as NCSES. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the tireless efforts and hard work of the indicator's authors. Uh, also want to thank Christina Fryman, and you'll hear from her later today, who's Deputy Director of NCSES. Uh, and I also want to acknowledge the hard work of my National Science Board colleague, Maureen Conduct, uh, who chairs the National Science Board's uh, committee that oversees the production uh, of this report. So very briefly, for context, a little bit about the National Science Board, for those of you who might not know. Uh, the National Science Foundation Act of 1950 charged the uh, National Science Board, the NSB, with two roles. The first is serving as a governing board for the National Science Foundation. The second is to be an independent apolitical advisor to Congress and the U.S. President on policy matters related to STEM research uh, and STEM education. The board's 24 presidentially appointed members work together with the NSF director and NSF leadership to pursue the agency's mission to, quote, promote the progress of science, advance the national health, prosperity, and welfare, and to secure the national defense, unquote. Board members serve six-year terms, uh, and we work together, as I said before, as a nonpartisan entity. So with that, let's turn to why we're really here today. Uh, Congress charges the board, and again, I will quote, to render to the president and the Congress a report on indicators of the state of science and engineering in the United States, end quote. You can see the landing page for the indicators report here, and I encourage you to go explore it uh, because it contains a wealth of data uh, about the US science and engineering enterprise. Uh, as I said earlier, Indicators is a suite of products that's prepared by NCSES under the active guidance of the National Science Board. It's the NSB's flagship product. It is a gold standard, reliable, policy neutral set of data and analyses. And the long term data reveal trends that can inform our policies and approach and our country's strategy for science and engineering. The full report, which we're briefing on you today, and you can see uh, the cover page of it here, uh, is the state of U.S. science and engineering, and it covers STEM talent, uh, discovery and research, and its translation of research into practice. Now, we also release indicators on a whole host of other topics, and there is a tool for data-specific indicators uh, and in coming months and, and uh, in the recent past, we have and we will continue to publish nine thematic reports. Uh, and these cover diverse aspects of the whole science and engineering enterprise, including STEM education, uh, research and development, innovation writ large, and public perceptions of science. So look for those uh, both on the website uh, and as they come along. So with that, what does the report actually show? Well, we're gonna dive into a bit more detail, but let me tell you the punchline at the outset. The US performs more total research and development, or R&D, than any other country in the world, and it conducts the most basic research. There's also been a substantial increase in business funding of R&D, uh, and the Chips and Science Act's investments are, are cause for celebration in this broad context. But the reality is we've only begun to meet the moment. The nation's global position in science and engineering is slipping. Particularly as countries in the East and Southeast Asia, particularly China, you know, increase their activities and their level of investment. Now, as our global position slips, the risk to our national security, our economic competitiveness, uh, and our public health continue to grow. It's time well past time 
for us to invest and reinvest in the future, not just to unlock nature's mysteries, as exciting as that is, but because investment in the future is critical to every American's future across the country. Now, we'll start with a little bit of context and more detail from Sylvia and Imelda, and then Christina will provide highlights from the report focusing on discovery and translation. Maureen will then present um, data on STEM talent uh, and policy messages from the board. In other words, what we think this data means and what it, we might do with it. And then we'll have some time for you to uh, ask questions and we'll try our best to provide answers. Now, finally, I have to point out uh, because uh, the work done by NCSES and the board uh, tries to be rigorous, statistically accurate, uh, and apolitical. By, necessar uh, by necessity, it is backward looking. Uh, that's the nature of, of rigorous statistics. So there are a few fast moving topics that aren't yet fully reflected uh, in the report. They will be in future years. And in particular, for example, some of the long-term impacts of COVID-19 they're not fully reflected uh, in the data. It's also worth noting, and this is my final point before I hand it over, that indicators reports, as I said, are retrospective rather than prospective because they depend on rigorous data. Uh, they, they contain good, hard statistics. That's why they're the gold standard for national reference about the state of our science and engineering enterprise. Uh, and as I said, because of that, they're necessarily uh, looking backward uh, in terms of data and analyses. With that, let's jump in. Uh, and I hope after that, we'll have a lively Q&A. So with that in mind, I'll hand the floor to Sylvia. Thank you, Dan. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Sylvia Barterfield, Acting Assistant Director for the Social, Behavioral, and Economics Director, or SBE, at the U.S. National Science. It's my pleasure to be with you today to share some information about the state of U.S. Science and Engineering Indicators 2024, or the Indicators Report. SBE supports basic research on people and society and on vital topics that enhance national security and provide new opportunities for American workers. The SBE sciences focus on human behavior and social organizations and how social, economic, political, cultural, and environmental forces affect the lives of people from birth to old age and how people in turn shape those forces. SBE is also home to the National Center for Science and Engineering Statistics, or NCSES. NCSES is one of 13 principal statistical, uh, federal statistical agencies and is responsible for statistical data on broad areas of interest, including the science and engineering workforce and the condition and progress of STEM education in the United States. In addition to conducting 16 nationally representative surveys on the s &E enterprise, it prepares several analytical reports a year, including the congressionally mandated biennial indicators report prepared with oversight by the National Science Board. As you will hear more about today, STEM talent is everywhere, but opportunities are not. NSF is helping create more opportunities across the country in several ways. Here are a few examples. First, authorized by the Chips and Science Act, the NSF's Regional Innovation Engines Program envisions supporting multiple flourishing regional innovation ecosystems across the U.S., spurring economic growth in regions that have not fully participated in the technology boom of the past few decades. In January, we were excited to announce the 10 inaugural NSF Engines Awards spanning 18 states. Another example that helps build research capacity and broaden participation in STEM, NSF's Granted Program, which stands for Growing Research Access to a Nationally Transformative Equi Equity and Diversity, develops the collective knowledge, skills, talents, and desire to serve within the nation's science and engineering enterprise. NSF is also ensuring the pipeline of STEM talent remains vibrant by creating more opportunities and discoveries through industry investments, partnerships, nonprofits, and other organizations across the US. From teachers to skilled technical workers to PhD researchers, NSF is investing in STEM talent through longstanding programs, such as the Advanced Technological Education Program, or ATE, 
the Graduate Research Fellowships Program, and other postdoc programs across the National Science Foundation. NSF Science Directorates, along with other targeted investments, are preparing the next generation of STEM professionals and investing in innovative research for those already in the field. While NSF is cultivating STEM talent and investing in every corner of our country, there's an urgent message from the indicators report. The, the trends we see within the US and abroad make it clear that NSF's vision, mission of supporting our nation's STEM talent is more important than ever. Let me repeat that. NSF's mission of supporting our nation's STEM talent is more important than ever. I encourage everyone to review the report to learn more about these and other science and engineering topics. Thank you. And now I'll turn uh, the microphone over to Ms. Amilda Rivers, who's the director of the National Center for Science and Eng Engineering Statistics. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Butterfield. And good afternoon, everyone. I am excited to be with you today for this webinar on the 2024 State of the U.S. Science and Engineering Indicators. Many thanks to all of you for sharing your time with us today. As head of the National Center for Science and Engineering Statistics, NSF Statistical Agency, I am so pleased to see the culmination of a lot of hard work over the past two years. We have collaboratively worked with the National Science Board to develop and disseminate this indicator's report, one of two congressionally mandated reports, and the board's guidance and very thoughtful collaborations have demonstrated our symbiotic relationship and have helped us give voice and narratives to the many trusted sources of data that you see here. Next slide. Indicators is the flagship report to the nation's evidence building communities, serving as the source for high quality and objective information on the state of the US science and engineering enterprise and serving as a prime example of collecting and integrating data from not just federal statistical agencies, but also vetting and using international data and administrative data to shine light on our science and engineering ecosystem. Many thanks to the NCSES staff who've pulled this report together. Many thanks also to the data providers and report reviewers in academe, government, and industry who contributed their valuable time and expertise to ensure we had the right balance of coverage. This process makes the report stronger and reflective of emerging areas of interest. Thank you. Next slide. Now we know that many of you may want data to answer questions related to the science and engineering ecosystem that go beyond what we can fit into our report. We encourage you to explore confidential federal data via the standard application process, the recently launched front door to access confidential data available from statistical agencies. In addition, for opportunities to access, link, and analyze nationwide data for evidence building, please explore the government-wide shared services and resources that are available through the National Secure Data Service Demonstration Project a place for securely liberating data and using information for decision-making needs across our nation. We look forward to continued collaboration with all of you to support high quality data acquisition, access, and analysis. And now I will turn it over to the deputy for the National Center for Science and Engineering Statistics, Dr. Christina Freiman. Thank you, Dr. Rivers. I will now turn to highlighting some of the data contained in the state of the US Science and Engineering Report. There is a lot in that report and we only have a short time today, so we'll only hit the highlights, but please check out the report online. First, this figure shows gross domestic expenditures on R&D by select countries or economies from 2000 to 2021 in billions of current dollars. And this is adjusted for purchase power parity. You can see here that the United States, which is in blue, is the largest funder of R&D with $806 billion in gross domestic expenditures in 2021. China, which is in purple, has $668 billion and is another top global funder of R&D. 
Data indicate that there are three factors behind China's R&D growth in recent decades. The rapid GDP growth, R&D policies, and private sector upgrades into high-tech manufacturing. Next, we'll focus on the detail of the United States expenditures. All sectors report funding R&D activities, as shown in this graph, with the business sector having the highest funding amounts since before 2000. In fact, private sector R&D surpassed funding surpassed federal funding in the 1980s, with further acceleration that you can see here in business R&D expenditures in recent years, and this is thanks to growth in several high-tech sectors. You can see with the orange line that the overall trend for federally funded R&D has been relatively fat, flat over the same time period, even though the absolute amount of funds did increase from 2011 to 2021. While this figure does show spending on all R&D, our report further breaks down spending by basic research, applied research, and experimental development. So what does this investment lead to? We do in the report present various indicators on the translation of these discovery, discoveries into industry and societal applications. But here we'll highlight publications, patents, and industry output. As you'll find in the report, SNE outputs are concentrated in the United States, East and Southeast Asia, and Europe. China has significantly increased its share of global science, technology, and innovation capabilities over the last decade, as we'll explore now. So first, we'll focus on publications. You'll see here that this figure shows that China does continue to be the top overall producer of SME articles, and we've seen that for a number of years. When you look at the most recent years, you'll note that many countries like the US, UK, Germany, and Japan did see fewer publications in 2022 than 2021. However, it really is too soon to tell if this one year change is really start of, start of a new trend. So I encourage you to tune in to our future publications. So next we'll focus on the citations of these articles. So we present this figure, which shows a highly cited article index, which can be an indicator of high quality publications. You, we did see in the previous slide that China is the top overall producer of these publications. But when we compare to the United States, compare on this indicator, the United States has a greater share of its publications among the most highly cited SE articles. So you'll note as you look at those, those most recent years again that the US trend has dipped and China has rose in the most recent years shown here. This growth in China's trend is even outpaces its overall growth in publications. Next, we'll focus on the research topics of the publications. So we show in the report a number of different topics, but here we'll focus on publication data on a topic of national importance, which is publications on AI research. This plot is based on publications from 2003 to 2022. So all encompassing all the publications published between those two time periods. And you can see that the data show that the US and China are the largest contributors, so the size of the circles, to the global network of artificial intelligence or AI research publishing. So publications on AI research. You can see that researchers from China, when you compare those two circles, researchers from China authored approximately double the number of AI-related articles compared to authors, those authored by researchers in the United States. So over this time period, when you compare the numbers. When you look at the lines between the circles, this indicates collaborative research, so co-authorship you see that collaborative research between the United States and China resulted in the largest number of co-authored articles of any country pair. Furthermore, when we look at all of the top 10 largest co-authorship country pairs, we see that each one of those either includes the United States or China. So the countries are very active in this topic as measured by, uh, by publications. We have a lot more data in our suite of project products on publications, but now we must turn to a different indicator, patents. 
And we highlight just one indicator here, which is an indicator of, of leading innovation. And this graph shows international patent applications. It's important we're talking about applications here versus granted. China, shown in purple, is the top overall producer of international patent applications. And you can see here in this graph that it has recently surpassed the United States, whose data is shown in Navy. If you go to the report, we also present data on awarded patents and also patents on key on topics of key interest. So again, I encourage you to check out the report. But next, we'll need to turn to industry outputs to highlight that. This figure shows the value added output of knowledge and technology intensive industries, or as we call them KTI. These, the data here is for 2012 and 2021, and it is shown for two sectors. So two sectors make it up, services and manufacturing. So the definition of KTI industries are industries that have high or medium high research and development intensities. So these are indicators of SNE capabilities translating into the marketplace and leading to innovative products and technologies. So when we look at the data, we see that the global value added output of KTI industries in 2021 was $10.6 trillion. And this was made up of 3.3 trillion in KTI services and 7.3, so the balance, $7.3 trillion in KTI manufacturing. In case you're curious, KTI manufacturing industries include, among others, pharmaceuticals, and also computer electronic and optical products, which include semiconductors. KTI, KTI service industries include information services, software publishing, and scientific R&D. The United States is the world leader in KTI services. And you can see when you delve into the data and is shown in this graph, that this is, we have doubled our output since 2012. For KTI manufacturing, China has the greatest KTI manufacturing output, and it has more than doubled its output since 2021, when we look in 20, uh, since 2012, when we look at 2021. So, Finally, what enables the discovery and innovation I have shown in these slides? Talent, the people. This map shows that there is a large STEM workforce across the country in every state. The lightest blue shade shows where the STEM workforce is at least a fifth of the overall workforce, while the darkest blue shades are states where the STEM workforce reserve represents over a quarter of the workforce, so a fifth and a fourth. So we have a wide workforce across this country. To discuss more data on the STEM talent and the board's key takeaways, I'll turn now to the board's s &E Policy Committee Chair, Maureen Kondik. Thank you so much, Christina, for that um, excellent overview of the data. Uh, in its advisory role to Congress and the administration, the board uses uh, issues reports and statements that work to foster the long-term health of the US SME enterprise and the NSF's critical role within it. In our Vision 2030 report, the NSB um, has provided uh, a roadmap for action to ensure that the US remains a global leader in SME. The board calls for urgently needed near and long-term investments, both for the fundamental research and uh, in fields that are key to US competitiveness and also for STEM education. This two-pronged approach is needed if the US is going to remain globally competitive in fields of the moment and to create a research environment and basic knowledge that will yield the next revolutionary advancements. Vision also identifies four broad areas for fostering SME. First, to deliver benefits from research to the US taxpayers and to empower our nation's businesses and entrepreneurs to compete globally. Second, to expand the geography of innovation to ensure access to training in SME in every state, in every territory, and every community. Third, to foster a global SME community through strategic partnerships. And finally, to develop STEM talent for America, our nation's greatest resource is its people.
Indeed, talent is the treasure on which the U.S. R&D enterprise rests. And I'll focus on three areas that indicators sh data shed some light on. First, the national need for a robust and resilient STEM workforce. Second, the fact that we are unfortunately facing a STEM talent crisis, and we really must build upon the rise in R&D investments to seize the moment. Third, I'll speak a little bit about opportunities for public and private action to address this need. We really must use a two-pronged talent strategy. First, to ramp up the flow of domestic talent into the STEM workforce, and second, to attract and retain talent from around the world. So first, STEM workforce needs. The STEM workforce, as you heard from Christina, represents a quarter of the US workforce, 37 million people. It encompasses all workers who use STEM skills in their jobs, 18 million workers with at least a bachelor's degree, and 19 million workers without a bachelor's degree. A group of STEM work for workers that we refer to as the skilled technical workforce. Demand for STEM jobs is projected to grow, but the nation must invest more in developing STEM talent if we're going to be able to meet that need. Which takes me to my second point, the STEM talent crisis. Investment in R&D remains a tremendous U.S. strength, and it is urgent that we seize the opportunity to build a more robust and resilient STEM workforce. To fill STEM job demands, our nation has increasingly relied on foreign-born workers, especially in the fields underlying critical and emerging technologies. So here in this graph, you can see the percent of occupations in the United States that are filled by foreign-born workers at the bachelor's, master's, and doctoral levels. Over half of US engineers and computer and mathematical scientists at the doctoral level are foreign-born. International talent makes significant contributions, valuable contributions to our STEM workforce, and is a major strength for the US R&D enterprise. But many security sensitive jobs require US citizenship and our current outsized dependence on international talent from China and India is a real vulnerability. It's not a given that the US will continue to attract and retain international STEM talent. Looking on the domestic side of the STEM workforce, we see other areas for concern. This figure shows one facet of the pre-K through 12 education crisis. The recent eighth grade scores on the main national assessment of educational progress mathematics assessment, subdivided by race or ethnicity or by eligibility for free or reduced lunch, one measure of socioeconomic status of the family, Figures on the left side of the mountain are eligible for free or reduced lunch programs, and those on the right are not. And yet it's striking that on both sides of the mountain, many students and student groups fail to reach the basic levels on the assessment, and only one group passes from basic to proficiency, to say nothing of reaching the advanced level. COVID-19 pandemic era declines in math test scores are the largest for individuals from races and ethnic groups that are already marginalized in STEM. Students scoring in the lower performance percentiles and those from low socioeconomic status households. The gap between the low scores and the high scores is greater than it has ever been since long-term trends first were recorded in 1978. The nation must rapidly recruit, train, and retain diverse STEM educators particularly for underserved student populations and school districts. At higher grade levels, the nation must ensure quality access through school districts or community colleges, dual enrollment programs to advance STEM subjects. When we look at the demographics of the US STEM workforce, we see an urgent need to address the missing millions and build a robust STEM workforce that our nation needs. But we have our work cut out for us. While the number of people from underrepresented groups in SE workforce has certainly grown over the past decade, faster increases will be needed for us for the workforce to be representative of the US population by 2030. To achieve that goal, the NSB estimates 
uh, estimates that the number of women must nearly double. The number of Hispanic or Latinos and Black for African Americans must more than double. And the number of American Indian or Alaskan Native SNE workers needs to quintuple. So we have a lot of talented people who are not represented in the force, the workforce of this nation at the levels that they're represented in the population. So what might we do to address this STEM talent crisis and the reasons that, that drive people out of STEM workforce? First, we really must improve access to higher education if students are to pursue advanced STEM degrees. Higher education costs, the percentage of students who are borrowing to finance their education, and the amount of total student debt have all grown in recent years. The US needs public and private solutions to encourage post-secondary students to pursue STEM studies, especially training in critical technologies and areas of national interest. Solutions should expand more economical options and incorporate recruiting and retaining the missing millions from every socioeconomic level. They should also build capacity at community colleges and technical schools, minority serving institutions, and emerging research institutions. These institutions are going to be key to growing our domestic talent and increasing diversity and geographic representation in STEM higher education. A second opportunity that presents itself to us would be attracting and retaining top talent from around the globe. The US is a top destination for internationally mobile students. And it's good news that international enrollment shown here across post-secondary education levels has rebounded to exceed pre-pandemic levels. The nation should continue to welcome international students from around the globe and implement policies that entice and enable them to work in the US after they receive their degrees. But the nation's current heavy reliance on international talent from only two countries, predominantly India and China, is a real risk for the s and &E enterprise in this country. Our country should be proactively welcoming students from emerging science partner countries low and middle income countries that are building their own R&D enterprises always be collaborative of tomorrow. This figure shows the number of s &E masters and doctoral students in the United States from the top countries ascending enrollees to the US. Emerging science partners shown in the map uh, in orange represent more than half of the countries sending the most students to the United States for higher education in s and &E. And this trend should certainly be embraced and encouraged to diversify our reliance on STEM talent across the globe. The US has an enormous opportunity in the potential of the skilled technical workforce or STW, STEM workers without a bachelor's degree. The map shown here shows the proportion of each state's workforce that is STW with the darker blue states having the highest share, as high as 17% of the overall workforce. The map also has an overlay of STEM degree granting community colleges, uh, the small orange dots that are speckled across the United States. And the distribution of these institutions shows that they have the ability to reach communities across our country. Factories, national labs, our military, government agencies, and others all need skilled technical workers, such as welders, electricians, and programmers. The nation must quickly ramp up their training and certification. And community colleges and technical schools are going to be key for this action. They fill in education gaps and they provide access to higher level STEM courses for high school students in underserved communities. They can also provide a more affordable access to the first two years of a bachelor's degree and they disproportionately reach the individuals who are represented in the missing millions. The US must continue to invest in programs that stimulate robust partnerships between community colleges and the private sector to help individuals access high paying jobs in the STEM economy and ensure that relevant and current information on career pathways are available to help inspire students to pursue STEM studies 
Investment in education at all levels is needed. Only with a robust and concerted effort to address this STEM talent crisis for at pre-K through 12, at the level of higher education, at the level of the skilled technical workforce, and for international talent, can the U.S. fully lean into longstanding strategic approaches to ensure that it remains a global s &E discovery powerhouse. So what are those key strategic elements? First, we really must invest in basic research. The U.S. must continue to lead the world in basic research investment, a key competitive advantage. The business sector funds almost as much basic research as the federal government, but this research is not distributed evenly across all disciplines. And the industries that are yet to be discovered need blue sky funding that only the federal government can provide. Second, we need to identify under the radar discoveries and opportunities. The US must continue to identify those ideas and explore new ways to nurture and mature them. Third, we need to invest in critical and emerging technologies. We must identify where the US needs to step up investments in critical and emerging technologies to strengthen fruitful and strategic collaborations so that we do not risk being surpassed by our competitors. The Chips and Science Act boosted investments in supply chains, critical technologies, and semiconductor training. The act also laid out a vision for, but unfortunately did not include funding to develop domestic STEM talent. Fully funding the act would allow us to build the STEM workforce that we so desperately need, expand the geography of innovation uh, and innovative economic activity, and speed up the translation of basic research conducted in the United States into products, goods, and services that benefit everyone. The science, technology, engineering, and mathematics workforce drives US innovation which is the linchpin of the nation's economy and our national security. The nation must take action to grow and support its domestic talent pool that is currently left on the sidelines. Talent is the bedrock upon which the entire US s &E strategy rests. And now I will turn it back to Dan. Thank you, Maureen. Um, and thanks to all of our other presenters as well. As you've heard, um, the indicators report confirms that the country's science and engineering enterprise is increasingly dependent, uh, certainly at the higher levels, on foreign-born STEM talent, uh, and it is also constrained by flat uh, federal R&D investment, uh, all at a time when many of our competitors are doubling down and investing uh, in their own talent and their own next-generation research infrastructure and advanced technology areas that are both critical to national defense uh, and also to global economic competitiveness. Uh, now, I will opine that I believe uh, it's time for the U.S. to consider uh, a new National Defense and Education Act uh, and, where appropriate, uh, increase uh, the level of investment uh, in our federal science agencies, uh, including through the CHIPS and Science Act. We funded the CHIPS part of the Science Act to help onshore semiconductor manufacturing, but the and science part was largely only authorized uh, and not funding. Uh, if we don't do so, uh, in my judgment, we'll continue to lose ground to our global competitors. Let's be honest, this country was built on dreams, uh, big, bright dreams of a better future. Uh, and it's determined action that made those dreams a reality. And it's time again to continue to dream, but to dream big and to act to secure our future. Now, I've been watching the Q&A. There are some terrific questions there, uh, and we're going to try to get as many of those in place uh, as we can. Uh, and I'm going to start with one that's related to several themes, and that's how do we increase investment in industry um, by, uh, uh, sorry, let me say that again. How do we increase the investments by industry and in evidence-based uh, practices in STEM that can increase recruitment, retention, and graduation of students in STEM fields? So first, full disclosure, I'm a former Microsoft executive as well as a longtime academic. Uh, and one of the things that's important to realize is we talk about that one quarter of the U.S. workforce that's STEM-based. Half of it 
uh, is community college-based STEM workforce, the so-called uh, skill technical workforce that Maureen talked about uh, earlier. The other half depends on bachelor's degrees uh, and above. And so it's important to consider that whole ecosystem as we think about those degrees. I think it's going to take new kinds of partnerships that expose students to the kinds of jobs that they actually are going to be getting uh, and the skills associated with that. There are a variety of things I think we can do to tune curricula, to, to encourage industry investment in those partnerships. Uh, it can be everything from uh, co-ops and, uh, and work study uh, to partnerships that fast track visas uh, for uh, many of our international students so they can remain in the US. There are a whole panoply of things there, but I'll invite my panelists, colleagues, if any of them would like to offer other comments uh, on that topic. All right, seeing none, let me jump on to uh, a few other questions then. Um, so here's a, a question um, that I'll read verbatim from the Q&A. Given that we're facing a post-SCOTUS, a, a Supreme Court reality in higher education, how do we ensure universities are continuing to support diverse populations of students? Well, as we talked about earlier, talent really is the treasure of our future. And as Marina and others noted, if we were to have equitable participation across gender, genders and other traditionally underrepresented groups, we would need to from double to quintuple the participation. Here's the reality. Talent is everywhere. Opportunity is not. Uh, and it's incumbent upon all of us to ensure we have that window of opportunity open. That speaks to how we address K-12 education. You've seen some of the challenging numbers associated with that, uh, but also how we think about opening the door via scholarships and cost of attendance uh, for higher education. So again, I would invite my colleagues to offer comments. I don't want to be the one answering all of the questions here, uh, but who else would like to comment on that aspect? Maureen. Yeah, I think it's it's a really important question, but I also think it's a question that doesn't have a simple answer. Um, we we need to think outside of the box, and I think one of the uh, most intriguing possibilities here is to broaden the input of industry uh, and community partners in in the education enterprise, in the recruitment and retention of students. Um, and to do that across the entire country. I mean, one of the exciting um, features that you heard about briefly, briefly today of the Chips and Science Act was um, regional innovation engines where, where the NSF has now awarded the first 10 of these very uh, significant awards uh, across a broad section of the country. And they've involved partnerships between academia, between industry, between educational institutions of different at different levels, uh, community leaders, uh, to try to uh, build innovation into into uh, to address specific problems uh, within within that geographic region, and I think that is an excellent model. It's a model that really has not been tried as as hard as it could have been uh, in the past, and I think I think offers a lot of promise to to build new partnerships, new strategies for recruiting students and retaining them. In, in these fields, not just as PhD scientists, but as, as welders, as electricians, as people who are gonna make a great income and are critically necessary for this country. I'll just add one other thing as we think about uh, recruiting and retaining global talent. This is a, a, a two-pronged approach. We have to increase the percentage of our uh, population that's uh, invested in STEM careers. But we also have to continue to attract talent from around the world. That has historically been one of this country's superpowers, that the best mm -hmm. and brightest talent on the planet wants to come to the U.S. because they have opportunities to realize, just like our, our own citizens, to realize their dreams. On a level playing field, by the numbers, we lose. Because although we're a large country, we are not the largest country. And as I said, talent is distributed across the planet and across the country. We want the best and brightest to come here. And yes, in some cases, there are national security issues that need to be addressed. But the overwhelming majority of those students who come here want exactly the same thing that parents uh, want for their own children. 
They want a better life. They want an opportunity for a fulfilling career, and they want to be a productive member uh, of our society. So one of the other questions uh, relates to uh, what percent should corporations spend on basic research? It's a good question, because if you look at that curve that showed that uh, uh, corporate spending in R&D has grown dramatically, while federal funding has been largely flat, it's important to remember that most of that growth, when we talk about corporate R&D, is D, not R. Uh, it's near-term translation of products, uh, of ideas into products. And that's exactly what companies should be doing, right? They're in the business of translating ideas into practice and making money. Most of the basic R that takes place in the corporate sector takes place in a small number of high technology industries. So it's not uniformly distributed across all of our economic ecosystem. That's an important fact to keep in mind. Uh, and it speaks to why basic research investment from the government is so important because it's the only uh, large mechanism to advance uh, ideas across a wide range of disciplines. As they say, research is what you do when you don't know what you're doing. It is the blue sky discovery that we often can't predict uh, its, uh, its effect. But if you look backward, it's easy to identify billion and even trillion dollar industries that grew out of ideas that at the time no one thought had practical value. Again, I'd invite any of my colleagues if they'd like to comment on those statistics. All right, well, don't be shy. Um, so here's another one. Um, uh, is there another option to fund uh, and create technology securely? Uh, well, I'll offer uh, one insight. Uh, yes, there are multiple mechanisms. Um, the U.S. government funds a wide variety of national laboratories, uh, and many of those laboratories conduct research behind a security fence. Uh, one of the challenges many of those laboratories also face is an inability to attract sufficient STEM talent. And those people need to be citizens, which speaks to why developing our domestic STEM talent base is so important. But yes, there are ways to do that research uh, in a secure way. Uh, the federal government, uh, as part of both legislation and executive orders, uh, is working hard on ways to strike a balance between, on the one hand, uh, recognizing that several technologies are dual use um, and that there needs to be careful thought about uh, how we manage that, but also the fact that we want openness. Uh, science thrives on global collaboration, um, and it is important that we remain at the table as a part of that. Again, uh, anyone want to offer other comments on that? I would, I would add that um, a number, a, a fairly significant percentage of uh, international STEM talent in this country uh, represents people who have become U.S. citizens. And so there, is, there are routes um, for talented individuals who want to make America their home to, to become citizens of this country and to remain here. Um, and that, that does broaden the, the base for a for more secure approach to, to uh, sensitive areas of research. So here's a question um, about semiconductors. And remember that the Chips and Science Act uh, provided billions of dollars in support for us to rebuild uh, semiconductor manufacturing in the US. And so I'll put that in a little bit of perspective. Only about 10 to maybe 14% of high-end semiconductors are actually manufactured in the US. Uh, and that includes most of the things that we use in our consumer devices every day, high-end microprocessors in your smartphone, the thing that uh, uh, the magic and the cloud that's behind those queries you do on your PC or uh, AI innovation, those things are driven by chips that are manufactured by and large by Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Corporation. And so that geopolitical risk is a lot of what drove the, the chips and science investment. But the other aspect of that uh, is that we need more semiconductor workers. Um, um, about 60% of the semiconductor workforce we'll need in the next two years uh, really depend on um, 
that skilled technical workforce. Um, and so uh, how we think about expanding that, whether it be by things like NSF's Advanced Technological Education Program, how we empower community colleges working with industry. This goes back to the other question about how do we, how do we provide clear pathways and industry support for that. There is a desperate need for workers in that space because absent that, we'll build factories that we can't staff. Here's another one. Um, how might we address declining enrollment, uh, particularly declining resources to support graduate uh, assistantships uh, in, in science and engineering? Uh, Maureen, I may throw that one to you and let you, you start off on that one. But again, I invite my other colleagues to offer comments as well. Well, you know, the, the way that we might address this question is, again, uh, either through investing money in graduate research fellowships to, to help offset the cost of education, but there are other potential creative approaches. This is, this is a, a recommendation the board has, has uh, consistently made to try to get the government to, the U.S. government and industry to forge partnerships that would allow for diverse sources of funding for education. So, so if the cost of education is barrier, and particularly for underrepresented individuals or groups uh, or people from lower socioeconomic areas, um, money has to be the answer. But it doesn't necessarily have to be tax money. It can be um, internships from industry that, that fund uh, students uh, with a commitment that those individuals will work in that industry for some period of time. You know, we do we do have models from, from our history of, of ways and from ongoing. Uh, the U.S. military, for example, uh, recruits people into areas with a commitment, pays for education with a commitment that they will serve in, in the military as a consequence of that. So I'm not suggesting that that's the only model, but, it, but thinking outside of the box and trying to um, not simply focus on the federal government as a funder for higher education, I think is is part of the answer. Here's kind of the reality that's driving that, though, for a bit of backdrop. Uh, the, the honest truth is, in many uh, domains, uh, we're asking the best and brightest of our students to take perhaps the six to 10 year vow of poverty, uh, <laughs> genteel poverty to be sure, but to go to graduate school. Uh, because in many domains, they have high five-figure, even six-figure salary offers with an undergraduate degree in high domain fields. Um, and graduate assistantships, fellowships, whether funded by universities, private sector foundations, or the federal government, have not really kept pace with that differential. Uh, and as Maureen said, when you compound that for first-generation students who may have uh, saved and scrimped and their family has supported them to go to college so they can have a better job, asking them to take on that deferred reward um, is a big emotional, psychological, as well as a financial burden. Mm -hmm. So we have to address some of those inequities. And when I have literally seen this, I have seen graduate students going to a food pantry because they, uh, they needed that extra support. Uh, and so those are real issues for social equity. We've got to do a better job. Some of it does mean more money, but I think it also means uh, some creative solutions uh, that are more than just financial. But um, this is a challenge that many of our graduate students face. Yeah. So one of the other questions uh, here, um, is related to, I would describe it as excitement in STEM. Uh, students are making decisions on whether they believe they're suited for a STEM career by the time they're in the third grade. How can we reach these young students sooner and maintain excitement and you know what mechanisms? Uh, I'll offer an anecdote and I'll throw it over to others. You know, the late uh, astronomer Carl Sagan said, if you go talk to first graders, they're just bubbling over with these amazing questions. Why do I have toes? How old is the world? You know, why is it round? Why is the grass green? Why is the, blue, the sky blue? And anyone who's been a parent has, has probably been bedeviled by those questions at some point. But Sagan went on to say, but if you go talk to 12th graders, it's like crickets. And he said something horrible happened in the intervening 12 years, and it wasn't just poverty, or it wasn't just puberty. 
Uh, and so how we inspire, uh, I think, is a big piece of that story. Uh, how we empower teachers with the resources to do that um, speaks to our equity issues as well. Because sadly, uh, many of the areas where students are most impoverished and face the greatest challenges are the places with the lowest level of investment uh, in K-12 education. And so uh, we're perpetuating inequities across generations. But we've got to share that passion because often the story we tell students about how science is done and how it's actually done, the passion, the excitement, the joy, uh, we lose that often uh, because teachers are overburdened uh, and constrained in some ways that prevent them from sharing that. But again, uh, I invite other comments from my colleagues. I would I would note that um, the NSF has excellent research on teaching methods that are effective and that that do help inspire students, get them to develop the skills of critical reasoning and maintain that curiosity. But they are work intensive and they require a knowledgeable instructor um, who's been given opportunities from their own school district to, to obtain this kind of training, to be positioned to, to follow these best practices. Um, and that, that takes a shift in mentality in, in many cases of, of seeing career development for teachers as being a critical component of education uh, ongoing and of maintaining uh, and building on the cur natural curiosity of children. So one of the questions I see in the chat is, is, uh, is it time for another Sputnik moment? Uh, and in essence, that is what I was politely suggesting about a next generation uh, science and defense act. I'm old enough to remember, and I trust that some of you are as well, um, the, the height of the race to the moon, and to be sure that was motivated in part by geopolitics, but uh, it was an all hands on deck notion that we were gonna mobilize the entire country uh, to do something that was barely within reach of 20th century technology. As we face new challenges across the globe, uh, I would make an argument that we are entering a new era of global competition. It's different than the competition of the Cold War, but it is real nevertheless. Uh, and how we respond uh, will be something that uh, future generations look back on. And that means, uh, as we have talked about rightly, how we address the K-12 STEM crisis uh, that our students are falling further and further behind the rest of the world, uh, how we ensure that there are equitable paths through the entire educational system, that they are valued and rewarded, not just financially, you know, that is a piece of the story, but a belief that they're doing something that's important for the country, that's emotionally and intellectually rewarding, uh, and that we address these persistent challenges that we know that exist in terms of equity and access. You know, I fundamentally believe everyone deserves an opportunity, and we have to ensure that we don't deprive the next generation uh, of the opportunities that some of us previously were beneficiaries of. Again, I uh, invite comments uh, from, from other people. All right, let me look for a few other uh, questions. Um, so has the chips and semiconductor manufacturing been reduced uh, in the US over a given period of time? Yes, as I was saying uh, earlier, we've seen a steady erosion of uh, US uh, domestic chip manufacturing over the last 20 years. As uh, semiconductor firms move to so-called fabulous models where they could do designs independent of the actual manufacturing, most of that manufacturing moved to either TSMC uh, or to Korea via Samsung, but uh, in, in a few cases to Europe, but overwhelmingly to Taiwan. And that's one of the geopolitical uh, risks that we now face, given the uncertainty of Taiwan and a perilous issue uh, given China's claims uh, uh, about Taiwan uh, sovereignty. So there were, there were uh, real issues there. Um, so. I want to, uh, we're at the end of our time. 
there were fantastic questions in the chat. We will try as best we can to answer those. Uh, and we invite follow-up. I would encourage you very much to go look at the wealth of data that my colleagues have described in the indicators report. Uh, it's customizable. You can pose queries. You can ask questions. You can look at everything, as I said, from the challenges of K-12 education to community college, skilled technical workforce, to graduate education, uh, to global patents and publications. Uh, and there were several questions about that. I will just note that Yes, when we look at those comparisons, that's the reason we track quality as well as quantity. It's why when we look at patents and other things, we look at purchasing power parity. We attempt in every way we can to normalize that data so we have realistic analyses and basic comparisons. That, again, I'll hark back to. That is one of the things that our NCSES colleagues are terrific at doing, uh, is making sure we have a rigorous basis for global comparison uh, of the US STEM enterprise. And so with that, I wanna thank all of you for participating. We invite, uh, I certainly do, as uh, uh, chair of the science board, questions or comments or thoughtful feedback from you on how we can continue to collaboratively advance the science and engineering enterprise. And so with that, thank you so much. We appreciate your participation today.